to uh, welcome you to this uh, beginning of the afternoon session. Um, the, I don't know, is it a robot voice? I don't want to offend somebody who uh, <laughs> has already done a lot of the heavy lifting with uh, um, <laughs> introducing people um, uh, for the session. And uh, our speakers will go in um, uh, the order for, on which they are on the platform. Uh, and we are uh, down a, a speaker. Sharon hasn't uh, hasn't come yet, uh, so um, we will um, uh, wait for her. Uh, you know, her place will be empty, and uh, um, hopefully, she'll be here before it gets to be uh, her turn. Um, just to say a little bit about each of the speakers. Uh, David Gordon, uh, his first book is called Cities on the World Stage, Politics of Global Urban Climate Governance, and that came out in, in uh, 2020. Um, ben uh, is a leading scholar in city diplomacy and helped envision the creation of the special representative uh, for city and state government at the State Department. Uh, Ben's an old friend of the center, and it's not the first time uh, that we've seen him on campus. Uh, Juan Louis is the author of Urban Diplomacy, A Cosmopolitan Outlook, which um, came out from Brill in 2021. And he's also uh, co collaborated with um, CPD faculty members previously. In fact, he and I had a piece on, was it COVID diplomacy uh, that, we did to, that we did together? Uh, so which tells you when that would have appeared. Um, and uh, Bion Zhu uh, has, um, uh, as, as well as working at the University of Manchester, has um, advised the um, Ministry of Culture and Tourism, uh, who, which one? China, of China, and uh, UN agencies too. So all in all, there's a lot of uh, experience coming to this panel, and I'm really excited to be um, uh, chairing uh, the session and looking at the research insights uh, that you are bringing to uh, the meeting. And if I could ask you to keep to eight minutes. And so we'll start with uh, David. James, thank you very much, Nick, I appreciate it. Is it okay if I stand? Sure. Uh, that way I can get out of uh, the side of the maybe the screens. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and a privilege uh, to kick things off on this afternoon's session. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, specifically the uh, dynamics of city diplomacy as they relate to global climate governance. The title of my talk, as you can see here, is Effective and Enduring. Now, um, when I came into thinking about and researching uh, cities and the role of climate governance about 10 years ago, a little bit more, most of my interest uh, sort of mapping onto most of the research and the interest at the time uh, was focused on the effective side of the equation. Um, what are cities doing? How, uh, what are the targets they're setting? What kind of actions are they taking? And can it all add up to? Um, and uh, that work, again, cities at the time understood a lot of things we've heard about today, enabled by characteristics uh, that are specific to them, sort of their freedom and autonomy to uh, to uh, uh, to act, uh, their capacity for experimentation and innovation, uh, uh, and then matched on to their propensity to work together in the kinds of networks that we've heard about in earlier sessions today. Um, uh, you know, joining networks like C40 uh, to enable learning, sharing, uh, competing. Um, and uh, and uh, working together, collaborating. And so a lot of that work was focused on the effective side of it. Uh, and as you can see, it's still where a lot of emphasis is. How much, you know, what are the targets that cities are setting? This is recent data that was uh, is collected by the Net Zero Tracker, which is uh, an independent group that works out of Oxford in the UK. Uh, and they track the uh, sort of uh, climate reduction commitments by 
just over uh, 1,100 cities around the world. And you can see here, you know, cities are moving towards carbon neutrality in various guises. There's still cities are adopting emissions reduction targets. They're joining global initiatives, the UN's Race to Zero, ICLEs Daring Cities, C40s, uh, Deadline 2020. So lots of ambition, lots of claims to global leadership. Um, and a lot of that, again, is grounded on this idea of sort of pragmatic orientation of cities and city officials and mayors. Uh, this is a quote from Michael Bloomberg, uh, former chair of the, that C40 network and sort of uh, and ministries of global climate governance. Uh, and this, again, highlights the idea that cities are flexible. They aren't held back by party politics. They aren't held back by special interests. They're there to get things done. I think that's an important uh, statement and one that captures a lot of the truth. And at the same time, I think it misses something. And that is the fact that there is resistance. There are barriers and costs related to cities pursuing an agenda of ambitious, transformative change. This is in part why I think we can understand or how we can understand the fact that cities have made these strong commitments, but have to varying degrees um, still struggle. They're still early on in that process of moving towards transformative change. This is research that was published by Mark Miro and colleagues uh, at Brookings. And essentially, you see here, just to summarize, a, a high degree of variables. Cities are doing really important and impactful stuff, and yet they're still early on that uh, sort of uh, trajectory of change. So how can we think about this question? How do we understand um, the barriers to moving up that pathway from getting uh, cities to ambition, the ambition of net zero, the ambition of carbon neutrality on a short time frame, uh, to the reality of actually bringing it to life. And to me, that is a question uh, that rests on the premise of legitimacy. If cities are to accomplish this, they have to be seen as legitimate. Uh, they have to be seen as constituting or serving a shared social purpose. Um, but more than that, they need to do so, and this is uh, sort of driving towards the focus of the research I'm going to talk about, I think they have to do so in two directions at the same time. Essentially, this is what I've been thinking of as the dual imperative facing cities. Uh, but cities have to secure legitimacy from both global audiences and local audiences, and they have to do it at the same time. That's really challenging. It's a tough needle to thread. Uh, on one hand, they're striving very hard to be recognized as legitimate by global audiences. So by international organizations like the UN Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change, by international financial institutions, by private market actors. Uh, and at the same time, they have to be uh, seen to be responsive to local demands. You remember the, from this morning session, Mayor Durkin labeled as part of the characteristics of cities. Not only they're agile, not only do they have a propensity to innovate, but they are the level of government closest to the community, closest to the people. So, um, and if they're going to initiate transformative change, they have to have buy-in, they have to have political support because Change is difficult. Transformative change is disruptive and it is costly. It is going to generate winners and losers. It is going to be uh, a difficult uh, practicality to uh, actually put into play. And so uh, cities have to find ways of building uh, and sustaining that level of political support. Yeah, what does my research do? My research cuts into this question by asking, on what, where are cities in this challenge? How are they positioning themselves in relation to this dual imperative? How are they reacting to this need of being responsive to both global and local audiences at the same time? And the way that we've done this, and this work is early work that I've been doing with a colleague by the name of Sarah Hughes up at University of Michigan. Um, we focused on transparency. Uh, we focus on transparency for uh, several reasons. Um, number one, we think it's a, an important precursor. If cities are to be accountable to their promises, transparency is an important element, though not sort of sufficient in and of itself to constitute accountability. There is a demonstrated link in the literature between transparency practices and perceptions of legitimacy. And, and there's a practical focus. Cities, city networks are increasingly talking about the need for more transparency. What we've done is try to study um, uh, the transparency practices 
uh, of cities around the world. So we can generate some essentially like a descriptive map of where cities are at. Um, we've got a data set of 344 cities drawn from around the world. You can see a fair amount of geographic diversity. Uh, the bar chart on your left here just shows population size. So you can see again some diversity in terms of the size of cities, mega cities down to moderate size, mid sized cities, uh, and smaller cities on the left here. Uh, and we've uh, uh, tracked transparency practices along those two dimensions. We've been looking at how cities render themselves transparent globally and then how they do so locally. Now, methodologically, and I'll kind of rush through this as quick as I can, we've divided up and scored each city on two bases. Essentially, visibility, how easy is it to find information about what a city is doing to both audiences? And legibility, what are they getting? What kind of information? What's the quality of information that's being provided? At a global scale, we do this by looking at data that's provided by CDP cities. This is like the sort of uh, clearinghouse for uh, climate-related disclosure. Uh, and they've got an open data set that we've been able to track from 2012 up to present. And locally, we've had to innovate a little bit um, and uh, come up with a methodology of trying to track these 344 very different cities uh, without actually setting foot in any of them. Uh, what we've done in order to get there is we've done two things. I had a team of RAs. We got them to land on a city government website and then record their experience in terms of visibility. How long does it take them to actually find information? We're presuming that sort of an individual who has an interest in understanding what their city's up to without necessarily having any prior knowledge. So how long does it take them to find information? How many clicks? And what kind of information do they find when they get there? And here we're thinking ranging from raw technical documents to ready to eat infographics, uh, you know, dashboards with uh, charts, visuals, very easy to identify. To give you a sense here of an example, this is the city of Saskatoon in Canada. You can see here, the click path, homepage, environment, dashboard, climate. Pretty straightforward, easy to get to. What do you find when you get there? You find charts, you find ready-made indicators in the suggesting performance and where they're at in relation to their targets. You find a breakdown of different issue areas. You find actual reports that you can look at. This, on the other hand, is the city of Anchorage. And you can see here, look at the click path, homepage, departments, mayor, aware, what is that? Resilient Anchorage. And finally, the Anchorage Climate Action Plan. What do you get when you get there? You get a bunch of reports that you have to download and sift through on your own. So a lot of work required. Add all this up, and what do we get? We get a score for each city in our 344 city data set of local and global transparency over time. Here's what it looks like. That was a long wind up. Here's the pitch. The pitch is this local score on the horizontal, global on the vertical. 2013 14, this is what those 344 cities look like. Very few early adopters of global transparency. Most cities clustered on this side with a sort of smattering of those who have some degree of local transparency uh, practices at that time. 2015, 16, you can see they're starting to move up and out. Now you see 2017, 18, it starts to get more distributed and up to present time, this is the most recent data we have. You see cities have moved up, they have moved out and to some degree across this way. What does this tell us? Again, this is just 2013-14 uh, in orange mapped onto 2021 um, uh, in the blue. Um, this gives us a starting point. This is an empirical mapping of what cities are doing, how they're reacting to this, trans uh, this dual imperative through the use of transparency practices. We can see two things. Number one, cities in general are getting more transparent in relation to their climate governance. That is interesting. So there's a pattern of convergence here. Secondarily, there's a lot of variation across cities in terms of how they're going about doing this, right? Cities are dispersed across this space in a way that is, to be honest, we're not sure we understand yet, whether this is just a time lag, if they're on a pathway somewhere, or if these represent different strategies to trying to address those legitimacy uh, considerations. 
And thirdly, we do see a skewing of cities that are leaning more heavily global and less heavily local. So if there's a skewing, cities seem to skew towards being more transparent towards global audiences. Kind of makes sense given the emphasis is placed on access to climate finance and the desperate need that cities have for it. Um, at the end of the day, what does this all lead to? It leads to a starting point. From here, the research that we intend to do, sorry, I'll come back here, is to dive into this data and try to understand it more. To understand it in terms of ground truthing, whether what we're measuring actually reflects the extent to which cities are trying to be transparent to their publics. And secondarily, whether there's actually any relationship between the level of transparency a city adopts and perceptions of legitimacy within those particular places. So we'll be selecting case studies from out of this space. I apologize, this data should have labels on it so we can actually understand what blue dots, uh, uh, where they are in the world. But we'll be selecting cities from out of here and doing in-depth case studies to try to better understand how these transparency practices, if at all, constitute to building stronger legitimacy foundations. So I know I've probably gone over, I apologize, uh, but thank you very much uh, all for your time, appreciate it. Hello. Okay, you've heard a lot about, uh, I'm Ben Leffel, uh, University of Michigan. You've heard a lot about city networks. What, what actually are they? Uh, so you've heard ICLE, uh, UCLG, Mayors for Peace. Uh, they're formalized networks. That, that's one of the forms that they take, but what, what are they really? It's, it's today, it's uh, organizations that uh, cities are joining, the uh, city governments are joining and sharing knowledge. And uh, myself and colleagues have kind of mapped the whole thing out. At least 10,000 cities around the world globally are members of these networks. And what it represents is the modern circuitry through which, you know, color-coded here, it's the modern circuitry through which cities exchange knowledge on gender inequality, climate mitigation, economic development, and so many other things. Uh, but among them, we were talking just now about climate mitigation and uh, ICLE being over 2,500 uh, member cities around the world, uh, as well as other city networks. You know the names, C40, Global Covenant, World Mayors uh, Council on Climate Change, and so on and so forth. Here's the important thing. Does it actually matter if we look at the urban decarbonization successes around the world, uh, can they be in part at least attributable to uh, membership in these networks? And in fact, yes, they are. Here's some of the first peer-reviewed evidence that globally for cities around the world, uh, in this case, 330 cities and 49 countries, but um, that available data is, is expanding. Uh, that's more memberships in exactly these, these organizations, ACLA, C40, and so on, and uh, other such organizations, we do see that there is a, a, a negative coefficient that is from between 2005 and 2013 that more memberships actually were strongly associated with productions, among other things. Does national policy matter? Of course it does. But cities independently taking action also is uh, in these networks are have making a difference. So that's a good thing. The message here is that cities of the world join these networks because they, they afford access to uh, things like greenhouse gas inventorying software, the, the best practices from other cities, right? Cities pilfering or stealing from other cities, but, but uh, it, it's in, the, in the, uh, the service of, well, what works? What ordinances, what do your ordinances look like? What, what knowledge sources do you draw upon? And even group discounts on retrofits, and it's important to uh, that. And, other um, play, uh, there are other networks that are kind of catching on. Uh, energy performance contracting is kind of a uh, you know if you're a member of this network and, and you want you know a company will provide um, a group a group discount to those services to decarbonize your buildings to solarize things like that. And so there's interesting public private inroads that are that are occurring. 
uh, and also access to finance, uh, access to the technology. And there's also kind of a, uh, a force multiplier occurring in which you know, the more simultaneous memberships that cities have in these networks, the more uh, visible that they are. And, and that, that can, can itself attract uh, investment uh, and it can create new opportunities. But really, it, it's the technical resources that these uh, networks actually do provide cities that, in fact, they make a difference. We want to see that negative coefficient because that means emissions are reducing more in those cities. Uh, and, in, and this is forthcoming, uh, but uh, myself and co-authors looked at uh, the power plants of the world, uh, about 22,000 of them. We see here the ones that between 2008 and 2018 reduced emissions, shown here as green nodes, and the ones that increase uh, emissions over time. This is at the city level, individual uh, power plants. Um, the biggest difference here, again, is uh, memberships in these networks. And the interesting thing is that particularly cities in the developing uh, world, uh, it's where the uh, impact is strongest. And why, why is that? We think it is because um, uh, they have further reach that these global networks uh, like Ipley, C40, that they can be more inclusive. Oftentimes, cities get their, their decarbonization services from, from, from environmental consultancies that might not have a presence in, uh, in less developed countries. Um, but both are good sources of knowledge. But in any case, the interesting thing here is that we see both, as I showed you know, here, the collective urban emissions reduction and successes can be facilitated meaningfully by memberships in these networks. Therefore, that's a good reason to join them and think of the whole urban scope of emissions reductions, but also in the energy sector. If your city has power plants, there's, there are energy sector specific uh, tools that many of these networks provide their member cities. And we're seeing that, yes, that actually translates to uh, real emissions reductions, even above and beyond the impact of an act strong national policies, which is exciting and interesting it, uh, because of the, the bottom-up innovations that are occurring. It's not just nations anymore, but inherently the city action globally is having you know, new detectable, meaningful decarbonization impacts. So why, why does this all matter? So uh, as myself and, and uh, Michele Acuto and our Chicago Council piece when we said, hey, policymakers, look, look at these, look at these findings, or why does it matter? First of all, filling national leadership gaps. We've talked about it all today, uh, and so it doesn't need repeating. But also, um, these networks like ICLA, they lead the UNFCCC's uh, local governments and municipal authorities constituency, the uh, city's voice before nations and before the UN. They've been trying this for 30 years, and their influence is growing, but cities are growing in their voice by way of these networks. Uh, and also, there's you know, at COP27, there was the first climate and urbanization ministerial. It's the first one, but it won't be the last. It's many meaningful, interesting ways in which cities are getting a, a voice as well here, in addition to the decarbonization impacts that we're seeing. But there are also new global strategies. I mean, the, the Phoenix mayor um, is using uh, membership in C40 as part of a Phoenix global rising strategy. Um, and that's... It, uh, both decarbonization and uh, incorporating uh, or achieving sustainable development goals writ large. Uh, there's new federal support, right? The, uh, the, the next, the, the new iteration of the uh, subnational diplomacy office, and previously it was Reader Joe Lewis in 2010, 2013. Now the next iteration is uh, with uh, uh, Nina, and the uh, special representative for uh, city and state diplomacy, uh, is working with cities like Phoenix and others to uh, join these networks to forge new ambitious global uh, climate strategies, uh, and there's new symmetry, of course. If, if, if it hasn't been repeated, if it hasn't been said yet today, there's the, the first cities summit of the Americas that, uh, that all of you should consider going to. It's going to be a very interesting and important moment in subnational diplomacy where mayors from across the Western Hemisphere will get together with networks, with CDP, with C40 and ICLA and so many other entities to, uh, to compare notes, to, uh, to partner to work and to uh, kind of uh, force multiply. Um, also, uh, there is also an important kind of, in terms of evolving city diplomacy in the climate space, uh, there's also a, a new innovation in the public private space. So you, you mentioned CDB. 
uh, I think. And so CD, this carbon disclosure project is also the world's kind of repository for corporate disclosures as well. So businesses are adopting ESG, environment, social governance. But what, what cities call climate action, companies call ESG, and they're the same thing. And the interesting thing here is that um, cities are waking up to the idea that they, or, and they're realizing that if they network with their local large climate disclosing cor uh, corporations, they can align their targets with one another. They can co-finance and they can achieve greater carbonization because the public's, the private sector, which is part of the urban emissions uh, boundary, uh, you know, if they work together, then public and private can achieve greater urban decarbonization. So I've developed a method of uh, identifying uh, nearly all of the uh, climate active corporations in any city uh, in the world. And I did this for Los Angeles. And so I don't know exactly where we, 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 uh, we are right now, but we see Citigroup, Ernst & Young, uh, and all of these companies, you know, Cisco. Uh, it, this is important because uh, if City Hall goes to these companies and says, well, can you, you, these companies themselves are adopting their own climate action plans. So working together means that they can uh, collectively reduce more emissions, co-finance, align their targets, that kind of thing. And uh, this, trend is, isn't just you know, a new idea. Uh, C40 and CDP have uh, created something called the CBCA, City Business Climate Alliance, to kind of harness uh, the new practices uh, that, that are emerging from all of this, because uh, Boston and London and many other cities are uh, engaging in these local uh, municipal corporate climate collaborations. And there's these new innovative practices. No one's written the guidebook for it, but CBCA is trying to put all of them together uh, because there's new potential. It's like, well, who are our green corporate neighbors down the street? And so with my method, it's um, working with different cities to help them identify exactly that. So uh, thus far, uh, I've talked about the actual demonstrable impacts uh, of city networks in collective urban emissions, in the uh, reduction of power plant emissions, and an important uh, new uh, wave of innovation that is just starting in uh, public-private climate collaborations, all at the city level. And uh, I'll, I'll end it on this. The, uh, the Climate Social Science Network did an a interesting little uh, piece on my, uh, on my research, and they used this really brilliant image uh, uh, to uh, go along with it. And, uh, it, and I think it says in one picture what uh, urban leaders in the sustainability space should be thinking about. And the takeaway of the, my talk here is that, you know, I mean, the battle, the climate battle is being fought in cities. The uh, achieving a sustainable future represented on the left, for yourself, et cetera, or a dystopian, uh, you know, very, very hot future. Uh, all of that will be determined by cities. Is that? Uh, after all, is where the biggest territorial source of emissions, but these are the mechanisms, these are the innovations, these are the things we should be talking about. They matter. We should uh, continue to push the envelope on these things. I'm happy to talk more about it in QA. Thank you. So, thank you very much. So, I think that eight minutes is because this is a pitch, no? Like, <laughs> because we're here in California. So, yeah. Uh, I have eight minutes to sell my book, so <laughs> I, I will try to do my best. Operators to stand involved. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so the idea is that I have five ideas about why I think we have to start thinking about urban diplomacy instead of city diplomacy. And the first idea is that uh, for many years, city diplomacy has been very relevant for about 50, 60 cities in the world stage. And now more and more cities are incorporating international strategies to this uh, activity, probably because they are paying the externalities of globalization. So I mean, my point is, it doesn't matter if they, uh, what, what do you think about immigration, health, many topics we have been discussing today. You have this problem here today. And it doesn't matter if your city is 1 million population, 10 million, or only 300, thousand population like many cities in Spain. So this is a change in the nature of the impact of diplomacy. I think it's also a change in the agenda. So more actors and more agenda. The second idea is connected probably with your idea of legitimacy and transparency. So we have this fantastic summit 
because we have to recover democracy and trust and many things. But what about the city? So these all these activities connected with democracy starts in the city, not at the federal level, not at the national level. It's very difficult to explain all this democracy and abstract ideas without connecting with real uh, people and with citizen demands, sometimes connected with diversity, sometimes connected with migration, sometimes connected with diaspora. To complete my argument, I will say that uh, cities that are more involved in this cosmopolitan agenda usually are less, uh, uh, they will let, they will vote less to populist options. So this is something to consider. And the second argument here is that if we don't pay attention to these places, probably they are starting to be what the, the fairy name places that don't matter. And do you know what happens when the place don't matter? They start to vote populist options or start to vote to things that are against this summit of democracy. So this is how to start. The third big idea is the what, what they call the fast food policies. In my experience, in my research, what I saw is many cities trying to copy big cities, probably because it's trending, probably because it's fantastic, and probably because there's a lot of um, false false friends in rankings and things like that. So to start uh, designing this urban diplomacy, the first thing we have to do is to identify our own agenda. What is what the social people, the social uh, activity demands? What is the people in the city demands? Sometimes it's, it's climate change, sometimes it's uh, tourism, sometimes it's more business investment, sometimes it's more connection with the diaspora. I don't know. But my point, again, connected with your idea, we need more transparency on why we are going to be involved in new networks. So then identify more than 200. So we don't need more networks. <laughs> And still from the academic side, I mean, because we don't have time to to do research. But what we need is to identify which which networks are really worth it for us as cities. It's impossible. Uh, I I think I remember San Antonio said six people at your office. So it's impossible to be involved in one hundred networks and really having an agenda for them. So we discussed yesterday that some cities are more than 50, more than 20, more than 50. I wish we have more people, more budget, more resources, and then that's what I wish. The fourth issue is about uh, new examples. So we have a lot of examples coming from Europe and North America, but we, we need more examples from, I will say, the small cities. I'm thinking right now, coming from Spain, in Malaga, not only Madrid, not only Barcelona, what's happening in Malaga, attracting a lot of investments, attracting the headquarters from Google and many American companies, they are moving to Malaga. What, why? And of course, what is happening in, in the Northwest countries. So I, I, I think there's less examples and less research on that topic, and probably we have something to do with it. And finally, uh, my, my, my last. Uh, feature of research is the impact of diplomatic theory. So I think that we agree that cities are not here to contest international relations. We are not here to discuss about realist principles and national security and all this stuff. But I think these are all time problems. Uh, borders, passports, so, so all this is fantastic. I think I, I come from Europe. So we have about 300 thousand people moving from Ukraine to Poland. Okay, what is to be done? No, you have to stop the war? Okay, fantastic, but what is to be done tomorrow? Because these people is here, and they need education, they need uh, uh, social policies, they need access to education, they need health, whatever. So my point here will be something, I will say, diplomacy by advocacy. So we have to move, we have to explain, and we have to to change the way we conduct diplomacy. It's not about who is in charge or not, or how to displace 
the state state centric approach to international relations. This is not going to happen. So probably what we need is to explore this uh, this path of hybrid governance and more places for for the citizen. And that's all. So I my book. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, While Sharon is setting up, she's associate professor of mass communication uh, and a faculty member in African American diaspora studies at Xavier University in New Orleans. And her books include Recasting the Disney Princess in an Era of Media and Social Movements, which is uh, uh, a great a, a great book to have in this town. So, uh, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to um, attempt to. Can you hear me? I will just borrow my pen. They can just. Hello? Yes, there. All right, great. So um, I, I am going to um, attempt in the last decade to center Black women um, and credit Black women in advancing um, notions of racial justice and equity. Um, in public diplomacy. So I want to um, sort of ground this um, work in an understanding of where we've seen this show up before um, with other scholars looking at um, ways in which um, historically marginalized groups have connected across space. Um, and then largely um, look particularly with the rise of uh, black women in elected positions of power, um, particularly at the city level to be able to map what are the particular components um, of racial equity framework um, engaging publics around growth? Um, so I'm coming from New Orleans. Um, so where have we seen others co-opt this bandwagon of uh, racial justice and equity in social movements? We've seen it taking place at the UN. Obviously, we have the decade of people of African descent. Um, and that's going up until 2024. But particularly watershed moment comes around 2020 when we have the George Floyd protests. Um, and we have many world leaders um, identifying and creating documents with how to engage um, peoples of African descent around the world. Trudeau taking a knee. Um, we have Macron um, issuing statements and documents. Um, and we have the EU um, articulating an anti-racism anti um, blueprint. So we credit where most of this racial justice um, initiative and ways of engaging come from, which have been black women, uh, particularly in the current contemporary context that we can date all the way back to 2009 and moving forward. And this is globally, both as elected political actors, but most of their roots um, rest in grassroots, right? Dealing and working with people of African descent, understanding their issues. And as these women enter the political domain, they then advance this in the ways that they engage people of African descent around the world. So we have, we can set credit to the Black Lives Matter movement to three Black women in the United States, these three. Um, we can also credit um, notions of Afro-Latino, um, Pan, um, Latin American uh, movements, um, and being articulated and championed by Francine Marquez, who's now risen to national level in Colombia as the first Black vice president. She's the second Afro-Latina vice president, um, the first one being um, in Costa Rica. We can also in Brazil look at um, Afro-Brazilian movements um, to slain um, Afro-Brazilian um, activists, um, Mario Franco. And then in the Caribbean thinking about um, decolonial reparations and de um, moving away from a Commonwealth um, allegiance through to Mia Motley and she has worked across the Atlantic. So what am I thinking when it comes to what is the approach or what we can learn from what Black women are offering in the space of public diplomacy across cities? Um, and I actually look to the concept of um, networked paradigms, and I'm drawing on R.S. Zaharna's work, if she's at USC, um, yeah. um, and her work in particular um, looks at the ways in which the US had to revisit its engagement with people around the Arab Muslim world um, post 
Um, and the ways in which they could reach hearts and minds, because the concept was we, we didn't want these people to kill us. So how do they see um, us in a positive light as a nation? Um, and so one of her main concepts here, as much as my colleagues pointed a lot to the use of um, a lot of information as a way to reach hearts and minds in her uh, understanding of reaching Arab um, Muslim populations, that um, information dominance is not necessarily an effective model for reaching this particular group, and that this strategy needs to shift to involve building bridges and networks, right? Um, and these networks needed to be authentic and credible, right, for people from um, uh, different parts of the world to view um, the United States, and but it's in this case in a positive light. And even in the past in public diplomacy, information one, right, building the strong network is the model when we're working with these specific um, relationships, right? So in terms of thinking about how to engage diverse peoples um, from a state state and state to people level, right, it required new tactics of which I studied online the ways in which black women are doing this. Um, and so firstly, um, they would identify and explore what those potential links are. Then they must reinforce those existing links and then create those links where none existed before. And this is the original 2005 study looking at it from how we engage our Muslim populations. And then after that, um, how we evaluate what they're doing as being effective. You know, a traditional way calls that we pull numbers, agreements, treaties, um, economic impact of ways of effectiveness. But in analyzing if this is an effective approach being pioneered to a specific demographic group of people, the old ways of how we assess effective PD doesn't work in this context, right? And so instead of using research that looks at numbers and whether we're achieving the right messages, um, we need to develop new tools to measure whether this is quality engagement, right, between those groups of people, right? By measuring the quality of America's relationships with these key publics rather than the quantity of viewers or listeners of research, how much messages we've thrown at them, how many um, treaties or statements of solidarity against anti-racism we can create for them, research can more reliably predict public diplomacy effectiveness by looking at the strength of the networks that are being built. So I wanted to circus in in my research, starting off first looking at black women who are elected um, as mayors in large American cities over 300,000 and the ways in which they are advancing racial equity re um, engagement around the world. Um, most of them, they are first for some of their cities um, or there hasn't been someone elected in that space for a very long time. And so here's a snapshot of some of them. Now we're up to about 25 of them being the first and what does their engagement look like? So first of all, adopting new tactics, which means when you are the mayor of a city where Donald Trump, who calls African nations shithole countries, um, your tactic looks a little different, right? You say to the world that you will paint where he looks uh, every day so he sees Black Lives Matter, um, and then you um, activate, um, you know, the, you call for enforcement when you invite people from the African continent, which she's done recently, um, to visit and engage on a national level. So she has leveraged her city position to contrast what Blackness can do in this space when the message on a national level um, is something that said at the time when she was first mayor, we, re we reject people of African descent as immigrants into this country. We um, treat people of African descent, African Americans, in specific ways as a national signal. So this new tactic for her says, DC is welcome at a time when Trump's tactic said, um, you are not welcome, right? So adopting new tactics is part of the framework that Black women mayors of large cities are advancing in signaling to a Black world that the United States has contrasting ideals of how we see and view you, how we want to engage you, and how we want to do business and other exchanges with you. Then we can explore potential links when you're the mayor of San Antonio, and perhaps you, your um, city may not have actively engaged people of African descent. Um, and in the case um, of uh, Mayor Ivy Taylor, who's a first time black woman elected to San Antonio, um, she then decided to establish relationships to her visit um, to um, Nairobi, Kenya, no, I'm sorry, not Nairobi, uh, Namibia, I'm sorry, 
And so um, in 2016, and developing those ties, particularly with energy, um, tech, and other areas that can strengthen San Antonio's relationship um, with the continent. Um, here we have a look in my city, New Orleans, of what is the advancement of cultural economy. Um, New Orleans is a very um, culturally rich city. And so this is Maya Latoya Cantrell, who's the first ever um, woman elected and black woman elected to the city in 300 years. Um, and she has um, engaged with the African diaspora world, um, a number of exchanges to um, bring culture and other things across different places. And then lastly, um, where there is nothing that exists, um, okay. where there is nothing that exists, you create something that is new. And here we have Mayor London Breed in San Francisco um, creating an Office of Racial Equity. And this Office of Racial Equity works close with her city diplomacy initiatives, right, to center racial equity in San Francisco's engagement um, outside the world. So we have those two things in conversation with each other as articulating her framework for engaging different parts of the world. And so you may ask the question, what does the city level playing for Black women? How does that help bubble up and reshape what we have at a national level? Well, when uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms is the keynote speaker um, for a major woman empowerment summit in Cape Town, South Africa, she now works at the White House. Um, as we could say, she walked so that Vice President Harris could run, right? And so here is her recent visit um, to the continent. She visited three um, nations. Again, a similar model engaging Black women um, entrepreneurs um, from a national level. But this took place first, and then we see this now transforming what is happening on a national level. So Black women are becoming, uh, in elected spaces, the models for what advancing racial equity looks like, and it's reshaping what's happening on a national level. Um, and it's many of the things that they championed prior to being in the political realm, but now as elected officials, they're able to enact this in their public diplomacy actions. So thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, I would like to start with UN SDGs and uh, goal 11 there is to make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So this is the only goal about place, but it's the goal that connects cities to culture and brings city diplomacy and cultural diplomacy together. But the question then is how and by whom? So to address that, I'd like to talk to you about my recent research on UNESCO Creative Cities Network. You see CDN as the multi-level policy tool for city diplomacy. And before I go into details, I just want to briefly you know, share with you some of the observations. So first, networks such as UCDN, they can take initiatives that you know the federal government or national government are unwilling or unable to do. And second, networks can function as a transnational policy tool that adapts to the shifting priorities of organizations such as UN at the global level, as well as the cities at the local level. And third, cities in networks, they are big enough, but they are also small enough to bridge people diplomacy or public diplomacy with government or official diplomacy. And they can shape agenda at national, local, and international level. And now a brief introduction about UCCN. So it was established in 2004. Um, so so far, uh, nearly 300 global cities joined the network in seven categories, including craft and folk arts, design, gastronomy, literature, film, media, arts, and music. Um, I think I have covered seven, hopefully. <laughs> so each of these cultures, they have their own sub-network and each nation also has their national network. So that's why you can imagine UCCN as a multi-dimensional framework vertically across institutional levels and, vert and horizontally across geographic locations and also in the third dimension across subject areas. So with that information, I would like to go back to my first observation that cities in the network can do things 
federal or national government cannot do. And the U.S. is actually a perfect example. So uh, U.S. is no longer a um, UNESCO member, but many American cities remain as part of this network. So nine of them spread across five categories. In fact, U.S. withdrawal, many of the cities are still playing leadership roles uh, in their clusters, and they are taking initiatives to promote good practice and awareness um, in their clusters. So, you know, like for example, like San Antonio and also uh, Iowa City, um, their city and their uh, executive director, they coordinate the entire cluster. They organize events among their uh, uh, cluster members, and they also review applications of future cities. They support their applications. So this illustrates that, you know, cities, they actually, they can act as agent themselves in diplomacy and even to fill in some of the structural hole at the federal or national level. The second observation is about you know, how networks such as UCCN, they can serve as a policy tool in the adapt to the shifting priorities of actors at different levels. And the UCCN has been effectively served the UN and the UNESCO's shifting priority, particularly from cultural diversity to sustainable development. And through this court analysis, we found out that the network was first established as a part of the uh, Global Alliance for Cultural Diversity Initiative, with the mission to unlock the potential of cultural industries to promote cultural diversity. And this remained as the focus of the network until the introduction of SDGs. And with SDG, the mission has been reframed to use creativity for sustainable development. So now the question is, if this is just a radical change, and how can UCCN support this changing priority of the United Nations and also UNESCO? So to answer that question, we look at number of cities joined the network throughout the years, and we discovered that you know, before 2013, uh, designated cities from global north were three times than the cities from Global South. And in the year of 2013, with SDGs being formulated, UNESCO announced to place culture at the heart of sustainable development. And since then, as you can see from here, the number of UCCN cities, especially for those from Global South, started to peak. And then interestingly, in some of the clusters, such as film and literature, which previously had zero presence in Global South, started to extend and move their networks to Global South, right? So there are multiple reasons behind these numbers, right? And first is because UNESCO has made it clear in its application guideline that they encourage applications from Global South cities and more specifically, South African and Arab states. But in addition to UNESCO's top-down action, this result, this shift to Global South was also a result of cities initiatives to make global impacts, or in other words, to perform city diplomacy. And this comes in two directions, from South to North and from North to South. So encouraged by UNESCO's guidelines, many of the cities in Global South, they seek help, they reach out to the current UCCN members to help them join the network. And the current UCCN members, they support these Global South cities in their applications as part of their agenda, as part of their you know, endeavors to build international links, to fulfill SDGs. So it's almost you know, this kind of informal and spontaneous mentorship that actually become, becomes, become common in some of the clusters, such as literature. And then the cluster, they decided to make guidelines themselves to support cities from global south. And these guidelines, they got translated by, their, by the current members of UCCN in multilingual versions and made available online. So what is fascinating for me, you know, from a policy perspective is that, you know, these 
bottom-up initiatives to support global South cities later on got institutionalized and formalized by UNESCO as a formal part of the network tool, right? So it's really this continued interaction between top-down and bottom-up that shapes the network as a policy tool that can serve the interests at different levels and in different geographic locations. And this is the process of policy learning and policy diffusion. So yes, you know, this shift to Global South was first on the UNESCO agenda, but the actual changes, they have been led, operationalized and driven by cities at the local level. And their initiatives influenced and got incorpor incorporated by UNESCO. And lastly, I just want to, you know, discuss or briefly mention how networks such as UCDN, they can be an effective tool for cities. So in addition to exchanging knowledge, sharing good practice, so what else? So this network, the UNESCO designation, is a lever, is a social capital that allows cities to mobilize resources, to offer diverse interpretation according to their context and their needs. So for instance, for us, for Manchester, this UNESCO designation of city of literature not only contributes to you know, growing number of international literary events you know, uh, to bring in more visitors, but more importantly for us is that it provides a reason for publishers and writers to relocate to the city. So it's, it's almost like a magnet, right? It produces uh, multiplier effects and compounding impacts. Right. But of course, you know, as were previous panelists said that you know, this network as a global policy tool uh, has its limitation, but we can discuss that another time. Lastly, I just want to conclude that cities as players of diplomacy, they are big enough and they are small enough because they can both shape global agendas, but at the same time serve to their local communities. And they are full of potentials to use creativity to address global wicked problem. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful, uh, wonderful set of presentations. Uh, I want to get discussion going with a question that maybe you can all jump in on. Um, my own interest is in uh, reputation and the way in which reputation can add to security. Uh, and the security in place. And I, I think that um, each of the city behaviors you're discussing obviously advances the reputation of the city. Uh, if a city is, if, if the world is in um, uh, trying to deal with climate and it's the cities that are uh, able to respond and respond effectively, if the world is worried about racism and it's at a city level, that issues of racism and uh, equality can be addressed effectively, the cities are con contributing to images of, um, uh, of, of countries. But so my question is, how do you see the image of city and the image of the nation state interacting? Do you see the cities contributing to the image of the countries in which they're locating, or are they generating a critique of the countries in which they're locating that are inactive on some of these key issues, like, for example, uh, issues around, around equality? Or is there a, a, a sort of a, a separate category of reputation emerging where, uh, as if people around the world start to realize that national authorities maybe can't do so much, but they can admire cities and they can admire citizen activists within countries. So I wondered how you see this. Could you recognize what I'm talking about and how do you see those dynamics playing out in the cities that, uh, that you know best? So who wants to start with that one? Okay, uh, so I see your point clearly. It's, it's a very good question about how cities are starting to consider reputation as an asset. Yes. It's not only about cultural heritage or something like that, but also 
out of fact investment, in my experience, the way to combine the mayors of people at the international area is that, hey, this is something that will affect the daily basis of your city. So, and it is connected with the main topics. You mentioned climate change, but they also uh, add the idea of migration. So I'm coming from Spain. We have a lot of uh, people coming from different countries, and this is something that occurs at the city level. It doesn't occur at the national level. This is probably, as you remember, that the movement uh, refugees welcome. So maybe the state is not interested or is going to uh, try to avoid this conversation, but most of the cities in Spain were uh, accepting these uh, people coming for two reasons. The first one, as I mentioned, because uh, at the city level, probably they have more progressive approach about what is this migration about. And the second one, sorry to, to, to say again about this is a question of money, because you need workforce. So I agree that cities are having to consider reputation. My wish is to avoid uh, confused reputation and rankings. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think they're two different things yes. because there's an element here of morality around reputation. And I think we, we're seeing a morality of um, being open to uh, diasporas and open to uh, displaced persons, refugees in general. Uh, and um, we, we may see nation states falling behind and cities being the places where new kinds of futures can be imagined, which will make them more, more attractive than the potentially more attractive than the host country. So you could be in a situation where people are angry with Britain, but admiring of London, for example. You know, to, to your point, um, the rise, the record numbers of women that have run, Black women that have run for office, whether they've run or not, but just run, was in the face of a national rhetorical image, right? Mm -hmm. That was anti-racist, um, that was racist and that was xenophobic, right? Um, um, so um, particularly the largest record number that can be recorded is right around 2016, right? When Donald Trump is elected. And if you look at Brexit, there are similar numbers um, for black women that have run in the UK and around the European Union. Um, so it's in result to, hey, we're here, um, despite the fact that our country's national image um, says that we are not fully citizens, right? Um, and so once that, I, I try to identify the fact that Black women have served in diplomatic spaces before, but at the appointment level. But when you're elected, it gives you a body that has given you voted representative power, right? Even if it's at a micro level to articulate this is who we are. So there's more power in being elected and articulating a form of framework, right? About a country's um, aspirations, DNA and morality um, as opposed to you merely being appointed, right, by a state or government um, to articulate um, their policy. And so it's that elected power at the city level or the municipal level that allows them to say, we also represent a group that put me in charge to say, this is who we are, this is how we want to engage. And that provides legitimacy that we hadn't seen before when Black women didn't get elected to positions of power to have the side of public service. Speaking of, of elections, to scale up to the global level, the, the question was, you know, are, are cities forging their own kind of identity morality versus it, does it reflect the nation state or is it in opposition to the nation state? So there's democracy story there. Uh, national de democratic regimes uh, like the United States and countries um, of, uh, of that ilk, they allow the autonomy for cities to, let's say in the 80s when cities got this with apartheid or even today when they, they, they were oppositional on climate change and influence leadership gaps. In other countries that still use city diplomacy, uh, but uh, are autocratic uh, like China, I mean, China very effectively uses city diplomacy. They have foreign affairs offices that, I mean, nice if we had foreign affairs offices at all levels. But uh, in that case, they uh, they can brand themselves only so far. They cannot challenge the nation state. Unfortunately, they can't take a moral stance, particularly one that is in opposition to uh, to the um, central and state. So what we found, what I did a study of city diplomacy in Britain, and what we found is that. Um, the, the, the cities spoke out uh, when the government didn't. 
So there was actually the, 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 the driver of city diplomacy was critiquing the government's foreign policy. So when the government was in, fa was in favor of the end of apartheid in South Africa or in favor of ending nuclear weapons, the cities were quiet on those issues. So it was it, it, the more the government was headed in one direction, the more the city was headed in the opposite direction. So they, they were conversely related, but he only wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just, I just want to echo what you just said, because I think you talk about this in your apartheid, that article about South America and, uh, you know, like the uh, activism that happened in uh, UK cities. I just want to say, again, every city is different. And we always, always say that, you know, London is almost like a, a bubble uh, in the UK. So we can't say that London is the UK. You can't say Beijing is China. You can't say New York. Um, it, it's United States, right? And sometimes I think, I almost think, you know, city image can be an illusion, right? It's an illusion, you can't say, maybe collectively, when you look at many, a, a large number of cities, you can see that collectively their images can be the national image. But if you look at the individual city, I don't think you can just uh, regard that or, or, as the national image. But what I think is important here, which can play the role of um, like the mediator, or you know, like it is the people, right? Because people people have mobility; they move around. And uh, if you think about like what we're finally just discussed, although we may have like misunderstanding about a city, but like if we talk with people, and it's like collectively that we learn about another country, their people, um, and their culture. Perhaps we would have a more, uh, I don't know, fair understanding about the city and the country. This is what I think. David, you want to jump in? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think I like you. I like what Ben and you know, saying. I think it, you know, the obvious first response is it depends on the country you're talking about uh, because it's going to vary substantially depending on the degree of uh, of centralization of authority. Um, my second thought is. Uh, to move on to what Wang Luiz mentioned, I think the idea of of rankings uh, and the sort of uh, the chase for capital uh, flows to become stocks uh, within particular cities is impossible to ignore. Um, and so I think on that level, reputation of cities it can be in direct contradiction to, and I think it's really motivated by that. So it makes me think of the sort of whole debacle around the Amazon second headquarters and the sort of uh, uh, the, the process that was undertaken to try to convince Amazon. And very much that was linked to all sorts of things related to sustainability and sort of urban form. Uh, and so that that certainly uh, seems to me that there's a disconnection there. I'm not sure that they're in tension. Um, and the third is just a kind of a macro thought, but um, but it's interesting that cities are both in tension with uh cities uh sort of with national governments whether it be related to migration the idea of borders who gets to cross them how do we think about security how do we conceptualize health or sustainability and at the same time um they're operating largely within the same playbook of uh you know um i mean even the very label of diplomacy is very sort of state centric uh and a lot of the markers of what it takes to get acknowledged as a city are very much derived from that world of international politics and it's kind of uh, interesting tension. So, um, any more questions from the floor, or ideas, or comments? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am an adjunct assistant professor at the U.S. School of Architecture and faculty fellow at the U.S. Center on Public Diplomacy because of my, my content and stuff. Something that's occurred to me as I've you know, been operating and learning more about public diplomacy is this issue of, you know, you guys are all academics and you have to operate within the realm of what you're focusing a lot of you on is reputation. But public diplomacy also operates within you know, understanding misinformation and disinformation. And we're talking about some of you are taking data from private sectors. And I have become very skeptical sometimes of the private sector because I know they've operated with 
let's just put it, I'm going to say misinformation about some of the facts that they have reported upon sustainability, climate change issues. And um, when I saw some of that in some of your work, I was, I was like, oh, well, that's what we in architecture also call greenwashing, where, <laughs> so I'm wondering how much of this boils into what you're doing, because a lot of it may not be, you know, it may not be intentionally, you know, unfactual, but some of it may be just building reputation, like, let's talk about China, the state itself, we know, is not necessarily going to be informed in that way, so. Very provocative. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Mina. I, as, as always, <laughs> I, to your point, I would say that in the case of the work that I'm looking at, um, most of these Black women elected officials are, are not doing this to build a reputation of their nations, right? Um, these are women who have specific backgrounds in doing this work at a community level. Um, and so the issues that they're championing that are playing out in the public diplomacy realm are authentic. And if you think about soft power, if you are to be taken credible, to be, to be credible, right, engaging with um, foreign publics, your track record is part of that effectiveness, right? So um, most of them indirectly are helping to build a alternative reputation of what a complex nation's image looks like, but their motivations and intentions of the bat are not to build anything. That is an indirect um, benefit that's being derived from having Black women operate now in this space, but that isn't what part of their credibility is that's how they're not perceived off the bat. When they go to engage foreign publics abroad, they're not primarily being seen as envoys of a U.S. State Department, right? They're being seen as Black women who are finally being given power in a country that has oppressed them, right? And that authenticity is why they are the most effective champions of interacting with people in the African diaspora. Well, I think we'll jump. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they also call it greenwashing and management and, and uh, in other disciplines too, when, when corporations say they're doing one thing and doing another. Do cities greenwash that they say that they're like, oh, we reduced emissions, we, we met our climate target. Do companies do the same thing? Well, um, uh, yes, but the best uh, uh, weapon we have against that is using metrics that they are producing that are third party verified, which is um, much of what you saw in my, my presentation. And, um, and are cities putting their money where their mouth is? Well, yes. Are there some laggards? Yes. Um, and the same is true of companies. Um, uh, means I'm finding in my research that uh, subsidies, like from free IRA, certainly post IRA, are helping companies actually meet their targets. So transparency is, is important and, and pushing for more data so that, you know, Analysts like myself can measure it and find like okay, okay, well, manufacturing sector isn't doing so well, but finance, financial, you know, companies, finance sector companies that are carbon disclosing actually are putting their money where their mouth is, and and cities um, all around the world that are joining these networks are meeting their commitments. Uh, yeah, I mean, broadly, uh, there is good reason to be skeptical because many people are probably cloud chasing and just uh, yeah. from the private sector, from the public sector, by all means. Stay skeptical, um, everyone. Uh, but but just keep pushing for numbers because that's that that's where you can measure if and when there is in fact greenwashing. So I appreciate. It. Thank you very much. I said leave the microphone. Doctor Lovers, thank you for talk for speaking today. Because I I'm thinking about many things. Oh, Sisters who are here, just let's do the clap because it's how we clap for each other. Uh, and when you talk about Ariel, I'm smiling. I'm from Senegal, from West Africa. We know about Mami Wata, our goddess that they copied to do Ariel that many people don't know about it. And uh, when you talk about uh, Black women and member of the RAF also that you show, uh, of the United States of the Women, and also specifically on Nigerian readers uh, who are. Helping to help women being elected uh, in the United States because we work as coalition to make sure that our voice are heard. And specifically, something that they go when we talk about the Crown Act, 
who knows about the Chrome Act? Okay, you know about the Chrome Act that we wrote on this SB 188 that have been brought just in 2022 because it is prohibited uh, discrimination based on our hair. People don't carry our hair the way we carry it right now. We call it the Crown Act because before people were discriminating us just by our hair or touching it without asking or telling us how we have to do it or no cone roll or the kids at school. Meaning we have to fight for that. And it was just uh, passed, this law was just passed in 2022. Imagine that. And when you talk about, uh, about uh, the tactic and the, the strategy, it's not about as an activist, because I know Ayo. I know uh, Ayo uh, Tomati from Black Black Matter. She's from originally from Nigeria. We know each other from many times. We are activists here. It's something that we, we need to be to, to voice more in the community to make sure that uh, we understand that it's not because we want to be seen. It's because there is a fight that started long ago some people don't know we've went through in Africa to 1300 years of slavery, Arab slave trade. We talk about the 400 years here, but there was also more than that, that make us you know, being uh, invisible. Meaning we want to make sure that today, what you talk about today, I'm really very thankful for what you said as an African woman, West African woman, there's nobody who travel in different country and in Latin America where we have the same issue with the Garifuna community. The same issue and the black second in Mexico who are facing the same issue. I mean, just uh, the law just passed for the black second to be recognized in 2017 and before they were bring like indigenous. Meaning, thank you again. And Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Manfredi, I just want to tell you why people are coming to your place because of the in Malaga, because of what? Because of the Chianti, the wine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for listening and allowing me to speak. I want to make a joke with you because okay, we have a look. I, I, I know, but I'm not sure. The <laughs> but we have a relationship with Spain, like Africa, Senegal, Morocco, with the Black Moors who are 700 years in Spain. And we are descendants of the Black Moors. Really, we have this joke always. Thank you. <laughs> very good. So are there um, other questions? Or do, does the panel wish to respond to round things off? I, I think people are ready for a break, actually. But, um, let, maybe we can uh, discuss things one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, at the end of the formal session. But I'd like to thank our panelists for a really interesting... Mm -hmm.